Let's uh, go ahead and get started here. We always wait a minute or two. Uh, I am um, very pleased to welcome uh, Emily Trichu here. She's coming over from the VA, the Long Commute, and she's been there since 2008, uh, since completing a fellowship at Northwestern and an internship at Brown. And Emily does um, a lot of dementia-related uh, uh, research from the very common things of like looking at the incidence and prevalence of uh, mild cognitive impairments to some of the more uh, uncommon things like looking at insulin to treat dementia, looking at some neuroimaging uh, in uh, spatial memory. And today she's going to tell us about her most sort of recent thing, um, which is looking at familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification and talk about that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'd like to keep this somewhat informal, um, so please raise a hand, speak up if you have a question. I know the folks um, via the webcast won't be able to do that. Um, if you all can hold your questions to the end and type them in, I can answer them at that point. Can everyone in the room hear me all right? That's a good place to start. All right. So as Dr. Borgazzani said, I'm going to talk today about familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification. I have to admit, I thought of trying to come up with a much more uh, catchy title, like a tale of two phenotypes. And I resisted putting it in the actual talk, but of course I just had to share it with you all now. It's a lot easier to say than familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification. So disclosures, just to let you know, I have no financial interests or conflicts. Um, I went through the VA IRB to be able to use these case reports, um, this case report information for educational purposes only. Um, so please keep that in mind um, as you think about and uh, if you talk to anyone about the cases. I have de-identified them and even tried to alter a few details that were not crucial to the cases to assist with anonymity. Um, but this is my first time presenting on such a rare disease. Um, and, and so I think that it's important then to have those considerations um, of the identity of the individuals involved in mind at all times. So I, uh, I do research, uh, as Dr. Borgazzani said, but I also do clinical work. And my clinical work is a memory clinic at the VA hospital. So the people that come to me, almost always, invariably, have a complaint about a memory problem. Sometimes they have a memory problem. Sometimes they don't. Um, often, I'm able to assist with diagnosis and treatment planning. Um, but then in some cases, like the ones I'm going to talk about today, my workup has nothing to do with the diagnosis. And it's, it's actually useless in that respect. Um, patient one came in. is a 45-year-old divorced Caucasian male. Um, and basically, the consult was to request what they always are, and that is memory changes um, in terms of attention um, and sort of being a little what we call disexecutive, that it had begun insidiously about two years prior. In this gentleman's case, um, there was an unclear uh, decline over time. Um, and it was in the context of some severe psychiatric symptoms as well as comportmental changes that had begun about six years prior and had gotten worse over time. This gentleman had lifelong depression, um, but never at the level it was uh, at this point, uh, where there was suicidal ideation and even thoughts of uh, plans. Um, he had a history of very heav heavy substance abuse. Um, and as a result of that substance abuse and some of the difficulties with the law he had, he finally got into psychiatric treatment at about age 30. He was intermittently followed for about eight years. Um, and in this period, he had started to develop these very intense guilt feelings. This is how he described them. Um, some paranoia, bizarre thoughts, um, you know, believing that people that he had served with in the military were actually Russian spies and he should have reported them and feeling guilty that he hadn't. Um, and he also, while never having um, visual hallucinations or very well-formed auditory hallucinations, he did have sort of whispers that he would hear that were sort of these guilt feelings swirling around. Um, so at age 38, he presented to the first time uh, to the VA, um, and not much later that year was hospitalized for his first psychiatric hospitalization. At that very first hospitalization, he was diagnosed with major depressive disorder with psychotic features, um, started on risperidone. Um, they had a neuroconsult and a CT scan. So here's his CT scan. Um, it's pretty striking. Um, I know it's probably, uh, you can't read the impression there, but basically it describes what you see here as the unidentified bright objects, which are calcifications uh, throughout the basal ganglia, in his thalami, uh, and in the cerebellum, um, as well as distributed in a few other regions. 
So patient two is a 72-year-old married Caucasian male. And, oh, big surprise, again, the consult was to uh, evaluate for cognitive changes that began insidiously about two years prior. Um, in this gentleman, there was a little more clear evidence of some decline over time. Um, and his problems were primarily with prospective memory, um, trying to remember to get to his appointments, take medications, um, a little trouble with multitasking, um, some anomia, and he was talking less than he had in the past. The family noticed that he was quieter. Uh, also, he had recently gotten a little confused and turned around, even in familiar places. He was out hunting in some woods that he knew well and got turned around there and uh, didn't turn up for a few hours after he was supposed to. Uh, he also was having some gait changes, a uh, little balance problems, and overall lack of energy. For this veteran, he'd always been very easygoing, um, and his family was uh, noting that he had some increased irritability, um, and he really had no history of psychiatric disorder, mood disorder, or otherwise. So here's his brain scan. Again, I think you can see the bright, bright areas on CT of calcification um, by uh, bilateral in the basal ganglia, thalami, cerebellum, very similar. So in fact, if I put these two scans, or the top row is the son, and the bottom row is the father, and I've just given away that there's a family relationship between these two gentlemen, you can see how similar the scans are. Um, we're at this point here, we're at the level of the basal ganglia, caudate head, um, and this is in the father, uh, sort of a mid-level cut here for the son, and then the father, and then the cerebellar uh, calcifications are a little bit less in the son and greater in the father. But overall, these are very similar patterns. So as you can guess, I suddenly wasn't the one trying to distinguish whether they had Alzheimer's disease or not. So the objectives for this talk are to have you guys be able to know what familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification is, review some of these CT signs and genetics involved with the disease, at least what we know. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about these two cases I've given you a hint of. So it's going to get really tough to keep saying familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification, but I'm going to keep trying. In fact, maybe I'll just sort of skip over it sometimes. It is a very rare neurodegenerative disorder. Um, and one thing that you noticed, I think, with these CT scans you saw is how striking it is of the symmetry of the calcifications. Um, and so they typically uh, appear in the basal ganglia, but also, as I showed you, very commonly in the thalamus um, and the cerebellum, particularly the dentate nuclei, as well as in the centrum semiovale. This uh, was actually previously known as Farr syndrome or Farr's disease. I've got a nice little picture of at least what the internet tells me is Theodore Farr up above. Um, he had a case report back in 1930 where he had followed and worked with a 55-year-old who had a bunch of seizures and then died <clears throat> while unconscious. They looked at his brain and saw this striking calcification, and it was in the vessels that were penetrating the white matter in the brain. But very interestingly, they were not in the basal ganglia. So somehow this name got connected to uh, this familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification. I don't know if that's the reason the name has fallen out of favor. It could be because there were at least two other people around the same time period who described similar cases. Um, or it may be just part of the general Germans doing scientific research during the 30s, not so good. Um, but overall, a striking thing about this is despite the similarities on brain scans among individuals that have this disease, there's a really wide both intra and interfamilial diversity in the age of onset, as you've seen here. Um, how severe their problems are, and the, the sort of um, combined picture of symptoms that they present with and or develop over time. There's even a case um, where someone under 18 was identified who, who had uh, clinical manifestations of these calcifications. Uh, so just again, uh, to give you a sense uh, with a little fuller uh, spectrum of brain slices, this is that first patient, the one who's in his mid-40s, um, coming from uh, inferiorly uh, eventually moving dorsally and superiorly, you can see um, how pervasive these calcifications are. Um, and one of the things I think about is when you affect the basal ganglia, uh, in particular in the thalamus, you've really almost created a disconnection syndrome from these relay parts to the, out, um, the um, heteromodal cortices of the brain. And then for our older um, patient, uh, he also has the same pattern of calcification, this just gives you a little bit more. He's got uh, a bit more superiorly in the Centrum Semio Valley. So overall, in this syndrome, not specifically these two veterans, 
Um, you typically see cognitive decline, psychiatric symptoms. There are movement disorders, which include gait changes. Um, there's dysarthria, often um, pyramidal signs, extra pyramidal symptoms. Um, and as I mentioned with that first case report at FARS, though, you also sometimes see seizures. Um, interestingly, a lot of folks, there's not a whole lot of research in this area, right? Um, no one's really done a great, um, there aren't enough individuals to do our typical style of research. But even in case reports, people have tried to find some correlation between the age of onset, how much calcium is there in the brain, and the neurologic deficits or psychiatric symptoms that the people present with. And so far, people come up empty on that. Um, what does seem clear, though, is that these calcium deposits predate the clinical manifestations um, by many years, similar to most of our neurodegenerative brain diseases. Um, no calcifications um, are seen outside the brain. Um, people have tried to propose some clinical subtypes. Um, Adrego and colleagues did. Um, and it's a really pretty idea that they have this predominant cognitive psychiatric syndrome, predominant extrapyramidal with Parkinsonism, and predominant cerebellar ataxia. I'll tell you, though, and this was done in 2005, and in the case reports and descriptions I've seen since then, the lines are very blurry. But are too bad that these two patients here don't fit that very well either. So um, as you might imagine, depending on your radiology uh, knowledge background, CT scan is, this is one of the cases where CT scan is much better than MRI for detecting um, the changes in the calcifications in the brain. And it's often an incidental finding, right? Um, You'll see it as a comment in radiology reports, a lot of times for older adults, oh, mild calcification, um, and not much is made of it. In fact, in our first veteran, the younger veteran, when that CT scan was first reviewed by a neuroradiologist, they thought it was an incidental finding for that veteran um, because they thought his psychiatric disorder was totally separate. So, oh, sorry, on the right side here is the MRI for this veteran, and then uh, on the left is the CT scan. So. When we think about the prevalence as well as the pathophysiology of um, this disease, it's really important, though, to try to rule out other causes of calcification, because there are a lot. And there are other diseases that can cause similar looking um, abnormalities on CT scan. Um, the low hanging fruit to rule out would be hypoparathyroidism, which can um, be brought about from many different causes. Um, autoimmune syndromes can cause changes in the brain that sometimes appear similar. Uh, Wilson's disease has been considered uh, an important rule out. It's also very challenged, our diagnosis of this is challenged by the fact that a lot of calcification, as I mentioned, is seen in normal aging. Um, I would say, though, that the um, differential is dramatically narrowed when you consider that these calcifications need to be bilateral. Um, they are bilateral. They are almost symmetrical. Um, things like tuberous sclerosis, yeah, multiple sclerosis, um, hypoparathyroidism, you don't typically see the, um, the distinct anatomical boundaries and symmetry that you see with this. So that all said, when you really try to do an, a, an excellent rule out, the idiopathic basal ganglia calcifications have a prevalence anywhere from 0.3% to 12%. Um, and this is in radiologic samples, so imaging studies that have been done where people looked at the numbers that came up, say, out of 1,000. Now, oh, of course, keeping in mind, people who go in to get their brain scanned usually are having some problems. There's a reason for it. So that would not be your population prevalence. So proposed mechanisms, this is uh, definitely a weak area for me as my cellular, uh, my molecular biology uh, training is this thin. Um, but for calcifications in the brain in general, it could be due to ischemic mechanisms. Um, also, uh, other types of inflammation that can favor calcification. Um, there's some studies that have looked and shown that there are reactive um, astrocytes and gliosis that occurs. Um, this calcium deposition may then be what affects, further affects glial functioning and also alters neuronal functioning. So the genetics, of course, in a disease like this are pretty, that's the first place you're going to turn. Um, it appears to be an autosomal dominant disorder. Um, I, in my review of the literature, I don't think I came up with any recessive cases. Um, it, we say it's incompletely described. It's being described as well as it can at this point um, when you have a very genetically heterogeneous group of individuals. Um, so the attempt to try to find a locus um, began in the late 90s. Um, Geshwind and colleagues uh, called their first locus they found on chromosome 14 um, IGBC1. Um, unfortunately, in trying to find a specific gene moving forward, there hasn't been as much support 
Um, and so the first three, just to let you know, chromosomal loci identified were one, two, and three here. The American family is the one described by Geshwin and colleagues. Um, IBGC2 um, was on chromosome two and described in an Italian family. And then IG, IGBC3 um, is on chromosome eight and was found in a Chinese family. So I would also point out in terms of prevalence of this disorder, it does not seem to have ethnic boundaries. Um, or uh, be specific to any, or more common in any particular race. So that IBGC2 locus, there was a candidate gene uh, that um, got some attention, and it was a secreted phosphoprotein 2. Um, it seemed like a good candidate, as it's uh, an extracellular matrix protein, and had a, believed to have a role in inhibiting calcification. Um, however, there's no real recent support in the literature for this gene as being um, a causative gene. For that three locus, this is the solute carrier family 20, which is a phosphate transporter member two. So this LC, L, SLC 282 gene, it encodes um, a sodium-dependent phosphate transporter. So if you think about the interplay between uh, phosphate metabolism and calcium, you cannot begin to understand why there might be some um, important interactions here. So it's implicated in altered phosphate homeostasis. So this gene, if you put together the studies that are out there, it appears to be responsible about 40 to 50 percent of the families studied, which is decent, but certainly not covering all of them. Um, and there's been a couple elegant studies that looked at where the gene is expressed in the brain, and wouldn't you know, the overlap for the regions where these calcifications show up is, um, is almost a perfect map. So right now, the cause of genes, we have three that have been identified. Um, there's the IBGC3 that I just mentioned, um, and there's actually two new ones. Just in the last year, I think, um, the papers have come out with these, um, and it's FDG-FRB on chromosome 5 and uh, IBGC5, which is uh, PDG-FB on chromosome 22. So I'm looking forward to um, seeing what more is found out as they realize that um, it's not always the same problem on this gene in the coding. Um, there's a number of different um, deletions and mis-mutations and things that have, partial deletions that have been identified. The common theme, though, is that they all have associations with phosphate metabolism and or transport. Um, and I uh, am not an expert in phosphate metabolism or transport, so that third reference there, Forster et al., is a really excellent paper, and it, I have the full uh, citation listed in the references. So. Getting back to the fact that we have patients and people that have this disease, um, there is no cure for it. Um, and really, the best thing you can do for someone that presents as possibly having this is do an excellent workup where you try to rule out all the possible disorders that could cause these types of symptoms and the calcifications. Um, these have endocrine, metabolic causes, um, and you would treat these if at all possible. So once you've identified that this is really familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcification, you want to try to treat the symptoms. Unfortunately, um, and there's been no systematic study of this, um, the Parkinson's symptoms that seem to appear do not seem to respond to um, levodopa or other drugs for Parkinson's disease. Um, luckily, risperidone, other, um, as well as other neuroleptics, do seem to be helpful for um, working with the symptoms of the psychiatric disturbances. Um, I've seen antidepressants used for mood disorder that often results, whether that's reactive to having this illness or part of the brain changes. Um, and what is not known, and I haven't seen any report on this, is whether there's any utility in using acetylcholinesterase inhibitors or maybe Nemenda um, for the dementing aspects of, these, of this disease. If anyone has any anecdotal uh, information on this, I'd love to hear it. Um, I think this will be an area that's looked at in the future. So I hope I haven't bored you too much with the nitty gritty of the background of the illness. Um, my goal now is to talk a little bit more about these two, the two people that have this illness. Um, I cannot go forward though without really acknowledging how many folks have been involved in the care for these individuals. Did you have a question? I, I did. Um, we were talking about the criteria requiring bilateral, is it also safe to assume that you need multi-level because most of the cases you presented, it wasn't just bilateral, it was bilateral at multiple levels of the brain. Is that also 
Well, let me, I'm going to repeat your question for the folks that are on the webcast. And the question was, is in the diagnosis of this disease, um, is it necessary to have calcification in more than, uh, in multiple regions, for instance, in the cerebellum, in the thalami, and in the basal ganglia? And my answer to that is, is that um, my guess is it's going to depend on when you catch them. So no, it doesn't need to be distributed so broadly throughout the brain. Um, it seems as if these cases at first shows up in the basal ganglia, um, and as the disease progresses, it's developing elsewhere. Um, but the thing is, is people aren't systematically scanning, the, say, the grandchildren or the youngest members of these families. Um, and uh, so the, the, pr the uh, onset and progression of the illness is not well understood. Uh, so again, just to make it clear, um, I'm certainly not one of very many providers, some of whom may be listening in or here in this room, who have worked with these individuals um, from psychiatry, neurology, genetics, psychology. Um, it takes a team. So just as a reminder of what the scans look like for these, plus I have a very wordy talk on my slide, so I decided I needed another picture to insert here. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Section of the anterior frontal lobe. For which? Um, on the sun or okay. the white matter. So they both have those. What is that white matter there? What, are, what is that we're looking at there? There are calcifications in the white matter as well. Is the white matter tracked? I don't know if I have any level to say if there's a track in there. Is there, there most definitely is a track. Um, I think it's the projections essentially from uh, the thalami up into the frontal lobes. Um, so you might surmise that you're getting a little bit of a frontal lobe disconnection. Um, but I, I left out the white matter, this seems to appear in the cases where the folks are more progressed. Um, and um, I don't know what association it might have with the symptoms you might observe. That answer your question? I should have said that question again out loud for the group. It was a question about um, some of the uh, bright areas, the calcifications in these regions. So I'm actually going to start with patient two, not patient one. And I'm going to start with patient two because this was the person I saw first. Um, the gentleman was in his early 70s, and the consult was placed to the clinic at the end of 2010 and early 2011 for our standard dementia eval. He, while he'd entered the VA system back in the early 2000s, um, he really was a very healthy gentleman and barely used the medical care there. Um, however, he came in for a neurology consult in 2008. He had gotten an MRI at an outside hospital, and the radiologist there, and it was for some little bit of balance changes, and the radiologist there had noticed there might be some changes in the brain, and so they went on in and came in for um, care at the VA. Um, and in that first neurological outpatient consult, at most, they picked up some subtle signs of Parkinsonism, um, but really um, no tremor. Um, it was a reported changes in gait and just a touch of rigidity. Um, and really, as I previously described, this veteran had no psychiatric history. Um, I queried audiovisual hallucinations, nothing. Um, and initially, when I was talking to him, it seemed like the family history was negative. Um, a mother who was over 100, who is still alive. Um, in terms of instrumental activities of daily living, these are an important thing to ask about when you're doing a dementia eval um, to see whether they're impacted. Um, the veteran uh, rarely drove now, and his wife said he probably couldn't do the finances if he needed to. But that's tough because he'd been doing that; she'd been doing them for years and years. So you dig in a little bit deeper, and really, if you ask them when anything had changed at all, they commented that 10 years ago he maybe had had some trouble starting with driving, and that was why he was driving less less commonly. Um, and in fact, it, they had a near accident with one of the grandchildren in the car. But for whatever reason, no one could pinpoint whether it was more now anxiety driving, whether it was that there had been inattention at the wheel, um, or a motor change that had caused this. Um, no one could really pinpoint it. He had just sort of handed over driving to his wife for most things. Um, most notably, though, the problems with memory and attention had become more problematic in the last two years. Um, as well as some of the motor changes, they described a scary incident where the um, patient had been pushing a stroller with a grandchild in it and had gotten a bit of a fascinating gait and had sort of going down a hill, lost control of the stroller. Everyone was fine, but it, it kind of got them to get reconnected with the VA and to get another neurology consult or to get the neurology consult. 
Um, in terms of med history, very little. Uh, the person had hypertension, um, and so on minimal medications, no uh, significant substance uh, use, like a rare alcohol drinker, never had smoked tobacco. Family history, as I said, mother alive over, at over 100. Um, his father had died in a car accident in his late 40s, so not much to go with there. Um, and the veteran was part of a citizenship of nine. Um, two brothers had died early. Um, and when you queried even further, um, the paternal grandfather might of this patient might have had dementia, um, but very hard to get a good description of those symptoms. Um, this patient has the three children, two sons and one daughter. The son that I'm talking about here today uh, is the one listed there with the psychiatric history. Um, and there are five biological grandchildren um, and with no known um, health, major health problems. So psychosocial history, raised in the Pacific Northwest, good student with a high school diploma. Um, I have the asterisks there because the wife bragged for her husband that despite having a very rough upbringing and being kicked out of the house and having to take care of himself from age 16 on, he still completed his high school diploma was in the military for four years, uh, achieved a rank of E3, and then was a truck driver, and eventually actually a harbor master, which is a position with a fair amount of responsibility um, involved. The family is very close. Uh, one daughter lives across the street with her family, and both the, P, uh, the son, P1, and his three boys live at home, as well as another son, his wife, and their two children. Um, so I think we might be seeing the basis of a pretty chaotic household here. Um, this patient is an outdoorsman. He continues to go hunting and camping. Um, they live on a big piece of land, and he farms and has livestock and is doing all of that work without any difficulty, at least none that was reported. So, neuropsych profile. I know this is a very wordy slide, but it seems silly to kind of go one piece at a time. Um, an important part of a neuropsychological evaluation is trying to get some sense of a pre-morbid estimate, what sort of was the best level of functioning this person's had. In this veteran's case, um, he clearly uh, intellectually was at the upper end of average throughout his life. Um, and a global screen for his age, a 27 out of 30 extracted MMSC, uh, or a 91 out of 100 for the three MSC, um, those were technically within the normal ranges. Um, and attention and concentration were within expectation, no notable problems there. Um, and memory was where we saw the first glimmer of problems. The new learning was below expectation. Once he got enough trials and got information in, he could hold it in over time. So that was not the pattern. I don't know if folks are familiar with sort of the pattern of Alzheimer's disease, but this would be the opposite of that. Folks with Alzheimer's disease tend to have that rapid rate of forgetting. This veteran just had trouble when he kind of had to encode things with just one learning trial. Visual spatial function was within expectation. On language, um, everything was really quite strong. The, maybe the one weakness was in phonemic fluency. That's coming up with a bunch of words fast that begin with a certain letter of the alphabet. Um, we contrast that with category fluency, where you have to come up with items fast that fit in a, a certain category. Um, in the executive and reasoning domain, um, really everything was fine except for um, planning, organizing a, a complex copy. And I'm going to show you in a second what does copy look like. The fact that it looks anything like the original is remarkable, given how poorly planned it was. Um, and there was motor slowing bilaterally um, manual. Uh, his mood, not depressed, that's the geriatric depression scale. A 7 out of 30 is considered not significant for depressive symptoms. So looking at his testing, I kind of, on the left side here, have just highlighted the areas where we saw something that was not within expectation. And right here, if you can see it very well, is his complex copy. Um, I'm on the other side of the table from the patient, so that's why my notes are upside down for you all. Um, but the colors here correspond to the order in which person started. So the blue, he started out with this little feature here, and then green, then somehow started making these parts of the drawing. And you can see how piecemeal this approach is. The fact that it was able to come together to look anything like the original is pretty impressive. So with these findings, who wants to guess what you would diagnose this person with without having CT scan, without having any of the radiology results? Anyone got a guess? Throw it out there. 72 year old. Memory problem. Dementia. We definitely have a, a good support for a diagnosis of dementia. Um, I think I might have gone first with uh, the top of my differential with Lewy body disease um, because we have um, the memory pattern that's not so much Alzheimer's disease 
um, but does fit more with Lewy body disease where learning is a problem but retention is intact. Um, although it doesn't fit with that very well is the intact visual spatial function that this person had. Um, also, we're not hearing about visual hallucinations. We're not hearing about waxing and waning of symptoms. Not that you have to have all of these for a Lewy body disease diagnosis, um, but they're the things you're looking for. Um, the other piece of it is it could be a Parkinson's disease dementia if you were able to establish that the motor changes uh, sufficiently predated these cognitive changes. Um, I work with what I've got in the moment, which means that I did not have, there was no neurologic evaluation, you know, five years prior. Another thing you might suggest is that it could be vascular dementia. Um, the thing about vascular dementia is it kind of can produce almost any pattern of results. Um, but it does often show the same type of memory pattern where you have trouble learning, but once it's in there, you can remember it over time. Um, it also could be an atypical Alzheimer's disease. You know, with age, that's your greatest risk factor for Alzheimer's, and so you almost always keep it in the differential. Um, clearly, though, all of these would seem silly to propose if you've seen the scan on this veteran. Any questions? Yes? What a severe cerebellar problem. Did you ever see this pattern? Symptoms and That's a great. So um, we've got a question saying, well, what about, would you ever see this pattern if it was a severe cerebellar disorder? Um, and I think that is actually a great question. Um, there are a number, there's a line of research that has looked at the cerebellum and how much more important it is than we think it is for more than just movement. Um, and actually, Dr. Bird, who's in the audience, turned me on to um, the Jeffrey Schmamann's article um, that reviewed this. So, Yes and no. Um, I would say yes for the disexecutive, the, the poor planning, and some of these symptoms, the motor slowing, um, maybe some of the, if there were, had been attentional problems. But the memory pattern, I still don't think you would quite see that particular um, pattern of uh, slow encoding, but up to, up to a normal level and then uh, in, intact retention over time. So patient uh, one, I'm actually working backward here, um, who was in his mid-40s, um, I saw him later that same year that I saw the father. Um, and he had actually come into the VA system via the uh, emergency psychiatry system in 2005. As I mentioned, a very complicated psychiatric history. However, he had no psychotic symptoms until he was in his mid-30s. Um, he did not have some psychotic break when he was 18 or in his early 20s. Um, by the time I saw him, he clearly had bizarre thoughts, beliefs. As I mentioned, no visual hallucinations, these very vague auditory um, symptoms. Um, and at this point, he could become very severely depressed at times. And while he wasn't sort of following through on any sort of suicidal plan, he was having some very impulsive acts. For instance, he, for instance, he got in an argument with his family in the car while driving on the highway and sort of impulsively said something like wanting to end it and started to start to throw open the door to jump out of the car. Um, he's become childlike and obviously clearly showing some decreased judgment. Um, in terms of psychiatric hospitalization, there are four in that span of years. And the second was just within two months of the very first psychiatric hospitalization. At that hospitalization, he had ECT for his uh, severe depression, uh, nine sessions of that. So in terms of IADL, the veteran uh, is not living independently. As I mentioned, he's living with his family. Um, at this point, he can no longer maintain employment. He hasn't worked since 2004. And he does, interestingly, have custody of his three sons. That was established prior to the, the symptoms becoming so severe. Um, his medical history, a little bit more complicated, but not much. He, um, when entering the VA system, was caught that he has diabetes, as well as high cholesterol, in addition to high blood pressure. He saw a neurology for first an inpatient consult, at which point the only thing they detected then was they thought maybe he had an action tremor, possibly an essential tremor. Um, but in his most recent neurologic workup, there's no sign of a tremor, and it's essentially an unremarkable neuro exam. Um, on meds, the diclofenac for pain, metformin for diabetes, mirtazapine, olanzapine um, for mood as well as venlafaxine, um, ritidine for stomach. Um, substance use is a very heavy remote history of alcohol use. He used cocaine also in the 90s. Um, current marijuana use, uh, about two to three times a week, um, and that's been going on for about 10 years. Um, he says it helps with his mood and with pain, um, and he does smoke as well. Alcohol, though, denied use, I would argue he's still having a few beers once in a while, but very uh, dramatically reduced use uh, in the past four years prior to testing. Um, 
he did have trouble with the law. I had mentioned he had a DUI and then 10 years later had a hit and run that was alcohol related um, and spent three months in jail um, in his late 20s. And this is when luckily, I mean, if you want to call it that, after that uh, incarceration period got connected with some treatment for his mood disorder and other issues. So psychosocial history, um, high school diploma, but he was never a good student, C's and D's. Did less than three years in the military, uh, was an E4 though. Um, and actually completed a computing tech one year program degree. Um, he never worked in that area though. Um, this is a time period where there was the drug use and alcohol use. He ended up doing semi-skilled factory work, was laid off and eventually was rehired, but at this point he was sort of just hosing down pallets and doing very simple unskilled work. He eventually was fired. Um, he said it was because his boss was a jerk, um, but his um, family members sort of outed him and said that he had been reprimanded numerous times for smoking cigarettes where he shouldn't um, and just couldn't. And again, when you talk to him, it wasn't that he sort of willfully was being defiant. It was just more that he couldn't get himself to care about where he went outside and smoked, whether it was in the designated area or not. Uh, as I said, he was divorced. Um, this gentleman has very minimal daily activities. He demonstrates um, abulia, he's apathetic, motivated, um, impersistent. You know, you could give him a task and he would be happy to try to help out and do things around the house, but it was very rare that he would actually complete a task. Um, and he also was sleeping a lot. That was one of the biggest concerns of the family members that came in with him. His appearance, this one uh, once formally somewhat neat uh, gentleman, was disheveled. He gained a lot of weight. He had an hyper, a hyper orality, kind of would eat whatever food was around. Um, Poor hygiene, we didn't want to ever take a shower unless somebody told him to get in the shower, and then he would do it just fine. So in terms of a pre-morbid estimate, this gentleman hit squarely at the 50th percentile. His global screen was very normal, 29 out of 30 on that extracted MMSE. His attention concentration for immediate uh, attention span and working memory were actually within expectation. However, his processing speed, as measured on visual motor tasks, was definitely below expectation. His memory performance was incredibly variable. Um, on one visual memory test, he did fine. On one, another visual memory test, he did poorly. One verbal memory test, he did fine. Another verbal memory test, he did poorly. Um, and what seemed to contaminate things was his uh, tendency to perseverate, introduce things from previous parts of testing, and uh, have just completely brand new intrusions as well. Visual spatial skills were within expectation. Language was within expectation. And he actually did quite well on some of the executive and reasoning uh, tasks. His abstraction, set shifting, those were all fine. Um, however, across tasks, there was some real disinhibition. You know, you couldn't put a pencil in front of him and a piece of paper and not have him immediately pick up the pencil and start to draw something, whatever he, anything that came to mind. Um, he also had slowing on group pegboard, which is a very fine motor uh, manual task bilaterally. Now in this uh, person's case, and I didn't highlight it before for our other guy, his mood was not depressed. For patient one here though, he had at least moderate depression. Now you might point out that I, for someone in their 40s, I used the geriatric depression scale. I did it because he had a lot of somatic kind of concerns and, and manifestations with his psychiatric illness, you know, all these vague um, gut complaints and pain syndromes. And so I really was trying to, I used this purposefully, trying to get more at true sadness, life's not worth living, those kinds of symptoms. And as you can see, even taking out all the physical complaints, I don't sleep well, things like that, he still was in the um, moderate uh, level of depressive symptoms on this uh, screen. So his testing, to summarize some of the key points here. Um, oh, by the way, here's an example. Up in the upper right corner is what the visual stimuli should have been looked like that you basically get to study this for 10 seconds. They get a blank piece of paper after I've taken the stimulus away, and then they have to draw what they remember. You get three learning trials on this. And by the third learning trial, his performance was getting worse. His first learning trial, he only had like one small piece, but he just kept adding in new details on everything. This is actually an intrusion from a test that was done about an hour and a half, two hours earlier, a drawing thing that he had done. Um, so while his performance Oh, and by the way, his retention wasn't that bad. Um, he actually lost some of the perseverative and intrusive details after the delay. So if you didn't have a CT scan showing extensive brain calcifications, what might you diagnose this person with? Anyone out here want to take a shot at it? <laughs> 
Ah, so uh, the question from the audience uh, for the webcast folks is that you wonder about malingering. Indeed, right? Um, I actually do effort testing um, on all the individuals I see, and he clearly passed all of those markers. Um, also, one thing that's really nice about working in dementia, if I can say that there's something nice, is that not many people want to malinger having a neurodegenerative disease. Um, the problem with that, if you're faking, is that you have to get worse over time, right? Um, but that is an important consideration. And also, sometimes sometimes people's psychiatric illness seems to get in the way of them putting forth very good efforts. Um, so we had evidence he had good effort throughout the testing. Another question in the back or comment. That's a very good question. The question was whether he had an exposure to combat, and he did not. Um, and so as far as I know, no toxic exposures, nothing like that. Um, so I see you guys are thinking really outside. I mean, with someone that's young, you really have to think very broadly. You think about seizure disorders. You think about brain tumors. You, know, you have to go all around. Now, in terms of a progressive illness with these types of behavioral changes and cognitive changes, I admit I'm biased. I jumped to frontotemporal dementia. Um, this guy had been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder, which I, this is not my area of expertise, but I don't think you would see such extensive deficits in someone with schizoaffective disorder, even when their psychiatric illness is at a point that it's um, uh, more prevalent. So for me, this was very much the syndrome, the clinical syndrome phenotype of a frontotemporal uh, dementia, the behavioral variant, not the language. And in this veteran, with this patient seeing him the one time, it was, a, it was a bit hard to establish a clear decline over time. The psychiatric symptoms, as they came and went, depending on how bad his mood was, as well as how chaotic things were at home, um, definitely showed that he was sometimes doing much more poorly than others. So that clear decline over time was harder to establish. So for our DSM diagnosis, DSM-5, um, for both of these uh, patients, they meet criteria for major neurocognitive disorder. Um, now, somebody in the audience might argue, well, this may be just a schizoaffective disorder for the younger gentleman, and maybe that's all that's going on. Um, I find it hard to believe you have that much calcification in your brain that it isn't somehow related to what's going on. Um, now, here's where the DSM-5 is a little less helpful, and that is that the subtypes uh, we have to pick from for such a rare neurodegenerative disease are few. So you could either go for a not elsewhere classified, or you could go with the Huntington's disease, prion disease category, which has a, a bit of a little catch-all with the due to another medical condition. Um, I don't remember. Actually, I think I did the diagnosis on both of these folks before the DSM-5 was sort of mandated. So I think I was able to escape that one. So I was actually able to see these um, folks again for a repeat evaluation. I sort of made it a family visit. Everybody came on the same day, which is why the older veteran I saw 21 months after his first evaluation, so almost two years, whereas the younger veteran I saw just one year later, which isn't as much time to try to pick up on progressive changes. Um, our tests are fairly sensitive, but that can sometimes be uh, pushing the boundaries for them. Um, for the older veteran, there was pretty clear decline over time. Um, there was a drop somewhat in his just global screen, um, and really a lot of the areas that he had had trouble with now showed, um, demonstrated even more problem. His uh, retention was now problematic. He could still had trouble learning, and what he learned, now he was losing things over time. He now had problems with set shifting um, and additional slowing um, from what was seen before, as well as, uh, somewhat disappointingly, even um, some increased mood symptoms. Um, and I believe it was after this visit that he was put on um, an antidepressant for his sort of irritability, anxiety, and depression. Our younger veteran um, showed a lot of variability over time. Now, he showed a lot of variability on the initial testing, too. Um, so it was both um, over time and within areas of cognition that you wouldn't expect to see so much. I bet the question again could be, well, was he putting in full effort this time? Um, again, the markers seem to indicate that he really was trying. And this person is just a very eager to please personality when you meet him. Um, despite this abulia, a motivation, he still is a, wants you to like him and wants to do what you tell him to do. He just can't ever seem to carry through on it. Um, let's see. There were some sensitive tests that did show uh, enough of a decline to seem clinically important. Um, that was on logical memory, which is a narrative memory task, as well as on phonemic fluency, coming up with those words that start with a certain letter. The memory test had flip-flopped. Um, 
he actually got a little faster on visual motor processing, sort of a processing speed task, and had less intrusions. Interestingly, his mood was much, while not great, it was more stable. He, by getting this regular care, and I have to give big kudos to the psychiatrist that worked with him, um, and getting his meds kind of dialed in right, um, so he in some ways was doing better. So, of course we have to do some genetic testing, and luckily I know some really bright people who do that. Um, so a big thanks to medical genetics at UW, uh, Dr. Bird, Dr. Chen, um, and Dr. Raskin, her lab. Um, so is anybody else, is anybody curious? What do you think? Positive, negative? Negative. Both of them for all three genes that are known. Um, so on one hand, I'm excited by the idea of like, oh, there's something new. On the other hand, you kind of want to know the answer, um, and we don't have that here. So some considerations. Patient one, um, our younger uh, gentleman, has less extensive brain calcification Yet he has an earlier age of onset, and I think it's easy to argue a much greater functional impact. Um, he can't work. He can't even pursue hobbies. Um, he's now given over, by the time I saw him again, had given over most of the parenting duties for his son to his parents, um, and really clinically has this frontotemporal dementia slash schizoaffective disorder presentation. Our older veteran, um, our older patient, has greater amounts of calcification, had the much later onset of symptoms, um, and less functional impact. Um, he really has a much better quality of life uh, in many respects. Um, and he presents with a movement disorder and a much more typical cognitive decline for an older adult. And so that differential is more of a Parkinson's disease dementia or a Lewy body disease. So our older uh, patient has clearly had the progressive illness. Mm -hmm. Patient one's a little less clear. We'll be seeing him again, hopefully, and be able to establish more of a pattern uh, of change or stability over time. So the thing that really is hard for me to wrap my brain around, and this is kind of what I hinted at, at earlier, is it, it's hard to know whether the localization of these calcifications might be what's most important, except that these folks really have very similar patterns. Um, is it the burden? Could that be the marker? And I caught myself thinking about some research I had done with multiple sclerosis back in my training, um, mostly just hanging on to other people doing the research and learning about it. Um, but it kind of reminds me of multiple sclerosis, where for some folks, you can really argue that this um, plaque in this area is what causes this deficit. Um, and in other people, they have brains full of plaques and yet function much better than another person um, with very few. Just It's such a heterogeneous presentation. So just thinking about brain calcification generally, should we screen for these in all patients? Um, if you do this, a couple studies have looked at it. Um, and when they looked at 4,219, I'm not quite sure how they got that number, why that was when they decided to stop, maybe funding ran out, I don't know. Um, when they looked at those consecutive CT scans, they actually found 14 folks that had basal ganglia calcification, but only 12 of those had bilateral, uh, a bilateral presentation. So that's kind of a low hit rate. Um, and then also in a different study, they looked uh, at 261 inpatients on a psychiatry unit over the course of three years, and in that population, they only um, found two who had the basal ganglia mm -hmm. calcification. Um, so you might consider um, screening, if you want to call it that, if treatment response is poor, um, if there's an unusual presentation, rapid deterioration, really the reasons why we would do brain imaging anyway. Um, so I guess the question I kind of catch myself thinking is, what would you have done if the younger veteran had presented to you with, their, with the clinical symptoms he did in his mid-30s? Would you have done a CT scan as part of that workup? I don't know. I think the only reason he got it was because they were considering ECT. And interestingly, they went ahead and did the ECT despite having found that, because it was argued it was probably just incidental. Um, so it's, it's important to think about, um, especially because we know that it can change how they respond um, to certain medications that might be used. Um, in a cross-sectional study of 85-year-olds, because we know that these increase with aging, um, they looked at whether there was any association between having brain calcifications. Again, not this rare neurodegenerative disease, but brain calcifications in general. Um, and they found no association with mood or anxiety disorders, but there was a relationship between the folks who had halluc hallucinations and delusions with also having brain calcifications. So anybody curious what uh, younger veteran specs looked like? Anybody guess there's probably decreased perfusion to the basal ganglia? That's what I would have put my money on. Nope. <laughs> he had preserved perfusion to the basal ganglia. Um, 
And interesting, there were some patches in the right frontal, um, in the temporal lobes, and the parietal lobes, um, but they, the re uh, reading radiologists argued it was nonspecific. It certainly didn't fit a frontotemporal dementia pattern. Um, so very interesting. I do. There's one case report where they did a PET, or sorry, a series of case reports where they did PET, and they did find decreased uh, metabolism, glucose uptake in the basal ganglia. So there's sometimes this split. So in conclusion, um, I think it's an important rule out to see whether there are uh, calcifications in the brain. Um, really, in dementia workups and for all ages, this is my personal opinion. Um, I hate it, but I guess the clinical phenotype for diagnosis is really unimportant. Um, so my testing, only useful for treatment planning and helping families understand why somebody does something, why they can repeat back five things to get the grocery store, but once they're there, they can't remember anything. Um, it's always important to keep in mind that misdiagnosis is very easy um, in these folks. Um, and that while those calcifications, as I said, they're not going to predict the clinical symptoms, they're not even going to predict the pattern of progression, but they can be important for a moment-by-moment -moment treatment plan. So for our patients here, thinking about them specifically, plan to try to see if they uh, want to come back in. Um, the older veteran, we actually weren't able to repeat all of his testing a second time because his uh, frustration tolerance, you know, he could tell he was doing worse. Um, and so a few tests he asked to discontinue. Um, and since there was no clinical absolute need to do it, I pretty much, whatever he said was what went. Um, so, but in terms of the genetics, um, one could do some whole genome sequencing. There's a recent uh, paper out that looks for copy number variants. That might be something where there's something still could be found on these known genes for these individuals. All right. So that here's the references. I'm not sure if this talk ends up being available online for folks, um, but I'm happy if anyone wants any of these references to pass them on later. Um, or you can contact me via email um, at etrit uh, at udub.edu. All right. Thanks, everybody, for all of your attention. And I will definitely take, oh, and if I made any paraphasic errors during this talk, I'd like you to address all the complaints to the management. <laughs> I had a baby four months ago, and he has not been sleeping well this week. So I've uh, been diagnosing myself with primary progressive aphasia. <laughs> Sorry, n nerdy uh, neuropsychology joke. There you go. I'm going to pull this up. To... Yeah, it's etrit, E-T-R-I-T-T, -T, at uw.edu. Correct. All right. Any questions from the uh, peanut gallery? And if you're uh, doing this via webcast, I guess you can type them in and I can see them there. Yes, Dr. Bird. Could I just comment? I'm a neurologist and if I've seen these patients. It always amazes me that somebody can have a third of their brain calculi and have a normal neurologic exam. Absolutely. Not even close. It doesn't look anything like normal aging, yeah. So we Absolutely. For the, if there's any folks on the webcast, a little hard to cover all of this, but the comment was is that the fact that the spec shows that there's still perfusion to the basal ganglia makes us realize that that calcium deposited there is not solid. There's no, you know, there's something still that's able to work there, um, or at least get blood flow. Um, and as well um, as the comment that um, aging calcifications that are seen are nowhere this near this extensive. Um, so if you look at the scans, while there are some calcifications, it is still strikingly different. Um, and then if I can remember the third point is, oh, is that you've seen um, folks who 
very much present this way. And you brought up the fact that there's almost a little bit of a Huntington's disease feel to the individual, the younger veteran, um, younger patient as well, in addition to the FTD behavioral variant. Any other questions? All right, excellent. Thank you for your attention and your time.